Divorce Podcast. Welcome to the Divorce Podcast, a podcast that aims to address divorce here in the UK, countering the often sensationalist way it's portrayed in the media, challenging the status quo and hopefully driving reform. On each episode, I'm joined by experts to discuss divorce from different angles and to give their opinions and to debate them. I'm Kate Daly, a relationship counsellor and divorce coach, co-founder of Amicable, the divorce services company and host of the Divorce Podcast. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Nigel Shepherd, Head of Family Law at national firm Mills and Reeve and currently National Chair of Family Justice Organisation Resolution. And David Leckie, Global Director of Divorce Hotel International. Nigel, David, thanks for joining me. Thank Thank you. you. Lovely to be here. It is. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. I'd like to start by talking a bit about the current divorce processes here in the UK. David, at the Divorce Hotel, you represent a pioneering approach to divorce, one that removes the adversarial nature of traditional divorce proceedings and offers a friendly and fast-paced approach to the process of separation. So what is it about the current divorce options that has led to the creation of the Divorce Hotel? Well, I think Divorce Hotel started about six years ago in the Netherlands. So it's a Dutch concept, which we just transferred to the UK just a year ago. And the idea, the, sort of the brainchild behind it, a guy called Jim Halfins, was aware that lots of clients were finding it very difficult to know exactly how long the whole process would take, how long it's, how much it was going to cost. So his initial idea was about offering a service whereby, from the outset, clients would know about that sort of time-limited nature to it. Obviously, it's a highly selective process. We're only wanting to work with clients who are wanting a positive and amicable outcome, and there's a very detailed assessment for that. But those people who are suitable for it, I think, respond very positively sometimes to having that time limited, know exactly when it starts, exactly when it finishes, and exactly how much it costs. Mm-hmm. And from what I tried to bring to the table at the Divorce Hotel is an additional component, because I'm really interested from my experience as a therapist and as a mediator for quite a few years, about attending to the emotional aspects of the process, because I think that that's where I like to see Divorce Hotel sort of going and developing, helping clients to bring their marital relationship to an end as positively as possible in the hope that they can have some sort of relationship going forward, obviously specifically useful if you've got children, for example, as lots of people do. And so that's the bit that's been missing traditionally in the way we've handled divorce here in the UK. Well, I I think that from my 25 years' experience as a therapist, I've met so many clients where a bad divorce has really affected children and those children they grow up and have become my clients and will often reflect have often reflected upon the awfulness of their experiences as children in the divorce process and I think we all know that the whole blame culture thing that has been present for so many years in this country doesn't help it does it that it puts that additional wedge in with so many people and of course who's going to suffer as a consequence of that not only the divorcing parties but also of course the children and that's what my sort of aim is when I got divorced myself I sadly had to endure not having a, a very good relationship with my sons for a period of time and I think that was on the back of a reasonably good divorce and I think that we know the horror stories of really bad divorces and all that can really go wrong with that. So if in some small way we can offer a service which encourages people to contemplate that conscious uncoupling process and divorce in a more positive and amicable way, still acknowledging all the feelings that go with it, but in the hope that at the end of the process they can leave still being, I love this expression which comes from the conscious uncoupling material, it's happily even after. And mm-hmm. I love that phrase. Mm. And that's what I think we're about, trying to get that uh, end uh, end goal. And Nigel, is that possible from a legal perspective if we have to work within an adversarial system? Uh, it, it's certainly possible because I think the system we've got at the moment, although it is set up to be adversarial, if people get the right advice, particularly from resolution members, it needn't be. And so everything that David said about the approach, about helping people to look forward, not backwards, to remember that people have often got children that even if they are separating and divorcing, they're not separated from their children and to help them to co-parent. So the resolution ethos and resolution was set up in 1982 
at a time where certainly family law work was really contentious. It was just like another branch of litigation, um, like suing somebody after a road traffic accident. And the founder, John Cornwall, realised and recognised that there was actually a family dynamic there. There was a better way to do it. And so however many years later, it's 35 years later, that has become the normal approach. What we've got, unfortunately, is a divorce law system that actually pushes people into a blame game. Right. And that's why mm -hmm. I am personally passionate about trying to change the law, so is resolution, and indeed so are most people that you talk to mm. about the need to try and say, look, we don't need a process that makes things worse. We're trying very hard to help people to be constructive, mm. to look forward. And at the moment, we have a system that militates against that, and that's what we're trying to change. But is a solicitor the right person to do that emotional support that David talked about when he was saying that the aim of Divorce Hotel is to really attend to that emotional space and that emotional sphere? Is a lawyer the person to be able to do that if that's what's the key to success of having an amicable divorce? I think it's very important that people who are going through this are able to access the help that they need in all kinds of different disciplines. Okay. I always say to my clients, look, I've been doing the job for an awful long time now. I have an idea of how you're feeling from my experience, but that is my experience as a lawyer. Mm. I am not trained personally as a therapist or a counsellor. So uh, we very, very frequently recommend to people that early as, as early as possible normally, they get that extra help, that outside help from the people who are qualified to do it. And I see it very much as a teamwork. It's a team approach. I think Divorce Hotel is a team approach. And it's one example of how you can help people through this really difficult time of their lives, but using people's different skills that they're actually trained for. I know having you and I having spoken before that you are very committed to that personally. I, I really understand that. But would you also agree that across the board, it doesn't happen as often as you might like it to happen? I, I don't see too many clients being referred from lawyers. And I wonder where that sort of where it falls down. I think you're absolutely right. And I think part of the difficulty is traditionally when there's a separation or divorce, the solicitors have been the first port of call. Mm -hmm. And that's actually something that's quite difficult to shake people away from. If they're feeling ill and depressed, they'll go and see a doctor. But if they come to you as the gatekeeper, if you like, which has traditionally been the case, it's actually quite difficult sometimes for the solicitor to say, look, I know you're putting your trust in me, but I'm actually not the right person to deal with this aspect of it. And that's a, that's a conversation that takes confidence from the solicitor and some experience and it takes confidence from the client because the, the reaction that you sometimes worry about getting and sometimes do get is well hello I've come to you because I'm told you're an expert and now you're telling me you can't yeah. do this and you're sending me off to somebody else it's going to cost me more money isn't it can't you do it all and that's the balance where to strike is to say okay let's start off but to try and encourage them to make their own decision mm. to go and see somebody else so it comes naturally i think we're a long way off that at the moment but we get we're further down the road than we ever were but is it that we've got the wrong first point of call then so i think you made the point didn't you david that actually the the, the main task here is an emotional task and there are the legal bits and there are the financial bits that we have to do if we didn't ref if we didn't go to a lawyer straight away but we went somewhere else straight away an intake type service that could then identify where the legal help was needed where the emotional help was needed and where the financial help was needed and where the children issues were needing some support if we came at it that way rather than saying actually the default position is to go to a lawyer who perhaps isn't best able to then refer out for all reasons that we know, mm. would that not make a difference if we were looking at this from a different perspective? I think, well, I think it would. I mean, some countries have tried that and, and have tried to make it work. Australia, for example, mm. um, you can go into yes. a building where all of those different professionals are and you can move around from one room to another. Mm. People can come in together. I think that cost can be a factor. Does it work um, in outside. Australia? I'm not sure it works completely. So I right. think that you'd have to look at the model. I mean, I actually think a model which wherever you go first, the person that you see understands the wider professional dynamics, dynamics yeah. and the mm -hmm. other professionals rather than it being people working in silos. So I think it's not just the legal profession that needs educating. And we're working really hard at resolution to do that and interdisciplinary working and triaging and all these things. But I think it's also other professionals that need to understand what a good family lawyer can do as well and, and see if you can get together early as yeah. a group. I think it's together. about considering the whole range. I mean, certainly with a therapist hat on, 
for many, many years. I, I've come across a lot of a lot of couple work, and I always make it clear when in, any couple comes to the first session, I've got no agenda whatsoever as the eventual outcome of that uh, that work we do. My only concern is that we work together to either help them to improve and develop and you know to nurture their relationship, or indeed sometimes to find a way to bring their relationship or their marriage to an end uh, as positively mm. as possible. And so there are people, I think, who, who have been introduced to the divorce process, for example, opposite a therapist, for example. For example, opposite a GP. I'm interested, I'm wondering how many GPs routinely suggest when their patient arrives mm -hmm. and beginning to talk about these issues. I, I haven't the faintest idea how many of them will say, well, maybe the first point of call would be go and talk to somebody about, you know, a, a counsellor, a therapist, whatever. Or how many of them might say, well, go down the lawyers, down the high street. I really don't know. But I think it's the route by which the clients eventually come to a divorce outcome. Where does that, where does that journey start? Mm. And that starting point, I think, is quite critical. And I mm. think there have been, sadly, sometimes I've, we've come across a couple, uh, some, some clients, divorce hotel clients, who've very clearly had some very negative, sadly, and I'm not having a pop at the legal profession. I know many, many, many <laughs> positive lawyers. We used to be best friends of lawyers, yes. Exactly. <laughs> some, some, of them are. Um, some of them are best enemies. Sorry, no. Um, but it's also true to say, and I'm sure Nigel would agree, that there are some s sad cases, and we've had some direct, and been, said it on, on the TV programmes we've been on, some of them. They've gone to see a lawyer for an initial me meeting, and a lawyer has started the process almost straight away about putting wedges, putting boundaries, putting barriers up between the mm. other party who's gone to see them. And I mean, one client, one client said that she went to see a lawyer and she'd been with her husband nearly 40 years. And this young lawyer sat at, we said, well, he may be saying these things about wanting an amicable back, but you can't really trust him, can you? And our client walked out and then eventually found her way mm. through a divorce hotel process. I'm not saying that is replicated day in, day out across you know, lawyers' offices across the country, but it does happen. And it's sad that it happens mm. like that. And I just think we need to be moving on and, 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 and doing our very best to help those sorts of experiences become less and less or fewer and fewer. Yeah, I think it's important to recognise that, unfortunately, in some marriages, or in fact, statistics show a lot of marriages, there is abuse. And that mm -hmm. abuse can be emotional, it can be physical, it can be financial. And the definition of domestic abuse is, obviously, as we know, widely mm. covers all of those things. Sometimes somebody will come to see me and they've come with a preconceived idea of what they need to do because they're separating or mm -hmm. divorcing. Mm -hmm. And for the sake of an hour or two with me, I can reassure them about some of the most immediate things that are worrying them. You know, where am I going to live? Can I mm -hmm. be thrown out of my house? Mm -hmm. I don't have a bank account of my own. Mm -hmm. What happens? You know, what, mm -hmm. what are my choices? You do not have to start a formal process in order to protect and reassure. No. But nor would I say, do you have to go to a lawyer to find the answer to those questions? I think if you're saying, how is this likely to look mm -hmm. in the future, say financially, mm -hmm. you know, am I going to be destitute? Mm -hmm. Many people could say you shouldn't be, but you can give that reassurance. You can say, mm -hmm. look, this is the kind of thing that you could be thinking about. Don't mm -hmm. worry about this mm -hmm. immediately. If you're worried about the possibility of being locked out of a house and it's not yours, there's things that you can do immediately mm -hmm. that are not aggressive. They protect you, but buy yourself some time. So I, th I think that can be very valuable for people. They get that reassurance. Mm -hmm. What I think David is saying and what we'd be concerned about is people who are pushed into taking action immediately before they've really got themselves emotionally ready for it, okay, yeah. where there isn't actually the need for that urgent mm -hmm. action. There are some cases, if somebody, is, if somebody comes to me and says, I think my husband's about to shift all his money into a place that I can't get at yes. it, yeah. you have to consider whether that's a realistic threat yeah. and you may have to take urgent action mm -hmm. before you do anything else. Yeah. And there are some cases that will never be suitable for mediation, mm -hmm. sadly, Absolutely. Yep. because mm -hmm. somebody is not playing mm -hmm. the game in the right way. They're not fair, they're not honest, or they're abusive. Mm -hmm. I think there are far more cases where we can be working into disciplining than we, than we do at the moment. I think that's really what the objective must be. So I th we're all sort of violently agreeing with this idea, aren't we, <laughs> that it needs to be a much more... Heated agreement, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. that there has to be this interdisciplinary approach. And I know, because I've talked to both of you before, we have been talking about this for quite a long time, quite a few years. There was a bit of a hiatus, wasn't there, when the collaborative approach came, and that might have been a new panacea for doing things collaboratively. It hasn't really panned out that way so what do we have to do to get a more collaborative approach or a more interdisciplinary approach from 
therapists, lawyers, financial advisors, tax accountants. How do we do that then? What has to change? Because we're all saying we agree with it. And I know it's a, a shared view from lots of colleagues, but it isn't happening. So what's got to change to make it happen? I think it's people building experience. I think it's learning from those parts of the country where a few people have mm -hmm. got together and have really made it work. I mean, collaborative practice has worked in pockets, has tended to work that way, mm -hmm. because it has its own momentum if people not just talk about it but actually do it and then can say from their own experience, I've just been doing this with somebody else in very similar circumstances to you. I think it can really work. Mm. It's quite a slow process, but I wouldn't like to forget the progress that we have made. You know, I, I've been practising since before Resolution was founded, and it really was so different then. Right. And the mood music has changed very significantly. So, you know, government policy, people are talking about the benefits to families mm -hmm. of, of trying to remove animosity as much as you can or to reduce it. Mm -hmm. I think that as the younger generation of professionals grow up, they're becoming much more used to this. Mm -hmm. So we have an organisation as part of Resolution called Y-Res. Yep. And these are the people in the earlier stages of their mm -hmm. career. And this is much more natural to them. They've grown up with it being part of the horizon. They may be in firms that don't actively encourage it, which is an issue. Yes. Yeah. I think, as to, for the want of a better word, as the dinosaurs drop off their twigs, <laughs> I think you're going to find that it, the momentum continues to build. But there is a, a very experienced group of quite die-hard practitioners still out there, mm. not resolution members, well, hopefully. In age terms, you and um, I are both dinosaurs, but we're not dinosaurs well, in terms of our attitude. We're not, we? but there are still quite a few people out there that I think you're probably not going to shift. Right. Mm. And as they move on and they're replaced, I mean, the judiciary is a completely different view to what it used to be. Right. So, so how has the judiciary's view changed, though? Well, I mean, they just they completely embraced the idea of conflict is bad right. i mean judges mm -hmm. have to judge and if they're faced with conflict and they're faced with having to make a black and white decision because you can only believe one side or the other mm -hmm. that's their job yeah they're not they may be trained as mediators a lot of the judges have actually trained as mediators before they become judges a lot of the judges are part-time judges who mediate in their other practice but that has all changed and so there's a real there's no principled opposition to the notion that there is a better way of doing mm -hmm. this but I think it just takes does take time. The pace of change could always be quicker. And I think we just need to continue to talk about it and to practice it. I think mm. that's the real key to it and to build that up. And mm. I think in five, ten years' time, I think the multidisciplinary approach, bringing people in at an earlier stage, will be increasingly more common. But I think it will take time mm. still. OK. So we're in the process of sowing seeds right now still? I think Are we're a bit shoots? further than that. I mean, mm, if you shoots. look at it, so I think yeah. we're out of nappies, yeah. Yeah. but we're still probably only toddling. Okay. Right. But is this, uh, are we toddling in a nice middle class way, though? So I know, David, in therapy, we have this endless debate, don't we, about how accessible we are mm. to people from lower social economic yep. backgrounds and that kind of thing. Is this not the same problem? You know, do you have divorce hotel customers or clients who come from lower social economic backgrounds? Sadly not, because of the, the price of the, yeah. of, the, of the package. And is that the same with the multidisciplinary approach? Are we going to bump up against the idea that it's great, multidisciplinary approaches is definitely the right way forward? Mm. providing you can pay for it. I think that's a very real problem. It's a massive problem. I yeah. mean, uh, people aren't even getting legal advice mm. Mm. because legal aid was slashed in 2013, yeah. completely slashed. So there are a lot of people out there that really don't have access to even early advice and guidance, mm. which means they're not finding out about the benefits of the other professionals that can mm -hmm. help them. They're going nowhere. They're doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it themselves within a divorce process that they are often learning about from the media. Mm -hmm who sadly frequently get it wrong. very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, we're still talking about custody Divorcing in the media, in which minutes. we haven't yes, had since exactly, yes. 1991 or whatever yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a real problem. People are not getting that help. And we're doing it within a divorce system that still encourages blame in order to get mm. on with things. You, you have to wait two years if you want to do it mm. without blaming the other person. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this blame game for a minute then. David, in the divorce hotel, the idea is that you do things without blaming each other, but what if there aren't grounds? Well, of course, we have to you know, find a ground, mm -hmm. don't we? Mm -hmm. We know what they are, either adultery or other forms of unreasonable behaviour. And, I mean, I don't know if you saw, um, we had a couple... I, I like talking about Paul and Janet because they were brave enough to put their story out yes. there on the media. And there's a gentleman who, he, his, his sexuality was the, was the issue. After many years of being involved,
involved in heterosexual mm-hmm. marriage, he was able to be honest enough to come clean about his own slightly more genuine sexuality. And of course, that causes a problem. We know full well you can't you can't divorce on adultery if you're having sexual relationships with somebody of the same yep. gender, etc., mm-hmm. etc. That's an interesting issue mm-hmm. in itself. Yes. Of course, yeah. it says yeah. a lot about let's, the legal system. Yeah, let's because, debate that. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but um, so we had to help them find a set of words. Or my colleague lawyer Claire Thornton, who I work with, helped them to find the, the appropriate set of words that they were happy with. They were. It was a very emotional process mm-hmm. for them. And I was very touched, but it was really very beautiful. There's a little clip of the couple, which they left it in the edit on the TV program, where Janet reached out and held Paul's hand mm. about the, the, how difficult that was for them. It was incredibly because moving, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was very, very, very moving. Uh, and I think that we, we know full well, don't we? We don't have to over-egg the pudding. We need to... Uh, I mean, you're the lawyer. You, you know much more about it than I do. I'm not the lawyer. But there, there only has to be a reason, you know, a, a small enough... Number of, well, we don't yeah. have to go. Sadly, again, I've known of cases through my legal colleagues where uh, uh, they've received pages and pages and pages of of allegation, mm-hmm. counter allegations. What's it all about? I don't get it. And the sooner we can move to a situation, I, 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 as you know, I I think you know, Kate. I spend a lot of my life in the Netherlands. I came across divorce hotel because I'm in a relationship with a Dutch person, and I've lived there part time for fifteen years. And they do it so differently over there. All we have to, you know, our relationship is, is, is broken down. There's no, no justification. Mm-hmm. It's just broken down. And if my relationship with Nigel has broken down, mm-hmm. however much he doesn't want it to break down, I think it has. Therefore, by definition, it has. No mm-hmm. argument, no blame, no nothing. It's just a sad fact about our relationship. And we proceed quite straightforwardly to divorce. And I, when I first came across that, when my Dutch um, partner was divorcing and I was divorcing at the same time, I was contrasting those two experiences, an English divorce versus a Dutch divorce. I said, I know which one I'd rather have. Mm. It's not the English one. No, that's and exactly. that's because of the blame. Yeah. You mean exactly. that's exactly... That's exactly right. And that's why Resolution is pushing for a change in the law. And it's something very close to my heart because I was chair of resolution in the mid 90s when we actually had an act of parliament that would have introduced Mm -hmm. no fault divorce but it never got implemented so i said yes when they asked me again because i saw it as unfinished business Mm -hmm. it's really really important dave is absolutely right you do not need reams of allegations Mm -hmm. the trouble is all those people that don't have the benefit of even basic legal advice aren't let into that secret Mm -hmm. yeah and there's some brilliant research by Professor Liz Trinder from Exeter yeah. University mm. called Finding Fault, mm. yeah. which has mm-hmm. researched in detail what people who are dealing with this on their own without yeah. any legal help actually think. So they get a divorce petition that says you've done this, this and this, and it goes on for three pages. The first thing is they get very upset by it. The second thing is they say, well, it's not true, so I therefore need to defend it yeah, in some way exactly. yep. without being told that, in fact, it makes no difference yeah. to the money. Mm. makes no difference to the children. Yeah. It's a means to an end. It's it's intellectually dishonest, yeah. which is what mm-hmm. the president of the family division of the Court of Appeal said in a case called Owens. Yes, People don't understand it. And it's, it's just a nonsense. Mm-hmm. It, it's just a sham. But everybody agrees that. Everybody, everybody you speak to, to you know, I, I can't think of a group even now who are still opposed yeah. to the, the changes that are being proposed by Resolution and others. Mm-hmm. Why hasn't it been successful? Because it's still seen as something of a political hot potato. Not as much as it was. Right. Um, there's this idea from certain groups that it'll make divorce easier. Yes. Well, no, it won't. It'll just make it kinder. Mm -hmm. There's ideas that the divorce rate will go up. Well, there might be a blip while those people who are waiting for the two years can suddenly get divorced Mm -hmm. for a slightly different period. But Mm -hmm. all the research, and again, Liz Trent has done a separate piece Mm -hmm. of research that shows those countries that have introduced it. There's been a blip, then it settles down again. Yes, exactly like Scotland, Scotland. our nearest Mm -hmm. neighbour. I mean, Spain Mm -hmm. has got no-fault divorce. So there's previously been a religious argument, and that comes from certain religious groups. But the previous act in 1996 actually had the blessing of the bishops. Right. So that, so even amongst the religious groups in this country now, there's no real opposition because actually all those religious groups recognise that what's good for people is to reduce conflict. Yes. And this increases it. And a very good example, you, you gave the example of the couple that you had. I was dealing with a collaborative case yep. and we came to that exact same discussion. Who's going to divorce whom? Yes. Because we only had behaviour as an option. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the... The woman in that relationship said, I don't want to do it. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. You do it. So mm-hmm. we went away and we came up with some thing that we could say. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very low threshold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. As really anodyne as we could. Mm-hmm. But then when she saw even those, she said, oh, no, I can't be doing with that. Right. 
So, so she had quite an emotional reaction to it then. Yeah, so it goes she, back she, to this yeah. and, emotion and we spent, being the driver. We spent time and money on talking about how the marriage that they both agreed had broken down mm-hmm. should actually be legally dissolved, mm-hmm. taking our focus away from what really mattered, mm-hmm. was how are we going to parent the children? Mm-hmm. What are the arangements going to look like? How are we going to make sure that both of you are financially secure? It took our eye off the ball for mm-hmm. quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Completely unnecessary. Mm-hmm. And a lot of money wasted, no doubt. Yeah, money wasted. Yeah. Yeah. And emotional and cost. And emotional. Yeah. Yeah. It's an emotional yeah. cost, not just yeah. financial. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, presumably by the end of that, you're in a worse co-parenting position having had to go around the houses and debate who was at fault and who's done what to whom. And well, that's right. I mean, this is a couple that was committed to try to do it mm. yeah. in a non-adversarial way, yeah. and yeah. the system pushed them into an adversarial yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens then is a bit like fault lines. Yeah. You know, they're like a San Andreas yes. fault. If you Everything nudge it and you part to, it, then yeah. the sort of molten lava starts coming mm-hmm. out. And they just wanted to close that fissure, if you like, and concentrate on other things. Mm. And the the law pushed them down a route they didn't want to go down. Um, So, Nigel, you mentioned there the case of Tiny Owens and her case that's now gone to the Supreme Court. What's gone wrong with that case then? Because, in theory, there's been this tacit agreement, hasn't there, that if we have to use behaviour because um, we don't have no-fault divorce, then it will get through the judges and it will just go past. But this hasn't, this is stuck. So what's gone wrong and what are the cost implications if you're caught out in this way? Yeah, it's, it's the marriage of Hugh Owens and uh, Teeny. It's actually pronounced Teeny. Teeny, sorry. Um, Owens, I had to ask as well. Um, <laughs> basically, it started off with a divorce petition mm-hmm. when Teeny said, the marriage is over, I'd like a divorce. But Mr Owens said, I don't want a divorce. So he defended the divorce. Now, that's really, really rare because right. the vast majority of divorces go through uncontested. And even those that start with a defence, quite often because somebody doesn't have the benefit of advice and doesn't understand that it makes no difference to the rest of what they're talking about. This was defended. Um, he couldn't be persuaded to drop his defence because the reality is that when you've got representation and when you come before the judge, you come under enormous pressure not to go through with a full trial of the matter right but he wasn't to be persuaded so he had a trial before a judge and the judge said on the law as it stands at the moment having heard the evidence i don't actually think there's enough here for the divorce right. now that itself mm-hmm. was really unusual mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's it's fair to say that other judges might have reached a different conclusion on the same evidence mm-hmm. but then mrs owens appealed to the court of appeal the court of appeal have got different criteria to apply they can't just say even if we'd granted we would have granted the divorce yeah. They can't do it as an appeal yeah. court. They have to show that the judge that dealt made with it an error. Yeah. made an error mm-hmm. was, was mm-hmm. plainly wrong. Mm-hmm. They didn't feel able to do that, but in saying they couldn't do it, they made their reluctance pretty clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mrs Owens has now appealed to the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in mm-hmm. the land, trying to find ways in which the current law can be interpreted in a way mm-hmm. that allows her to have a divorce. Because the, the ridiculous thing here is it is common ground that the marriage has broken down. They don't live together. Right. They live in separate houses. Right. She isn't coming back. Yes. There is going to be no reconciliation. There's no dispute mm-hmm. about that. So this is a marriage which is effectively an empty shell that has been kept alive artificially mm-hmm. because without being able to get the divorce on the basis that she's asking for it now, she has to wait five years and that five years isn't up until 2020. Right. And that actually stops her making certain claims and getting things finalised. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it really emphasises the reason we need reform. That's what the Court of Appeal has said. Whatever the outcome, whatever the outcome of the Supreme Court hearing, and I personally hope that she gets her divorce mm-hmm. and resolution of actually being given permission to intervene as third parties, interested third parties, right. so that we can help the court give the experience of our members up and down the country in in what this case has actually done because there's evidence that as a result of it, people have started to make the allegations of behaviour more serious than they had been otherwise because they're they're worried that the threshold has been raised by this. And in practice, it probably hasn't because for the uncontested cases, nothing's changed. But this is a really rare defended divorce. So whatever the outcome, the law needs changing. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope she gets a divorce. But even if she does, she's had to go to the Supreme Court, for goodness sake, to get it yeah. at a huge expense. I mean, well, Quantify I that mean, then. Oh, I, Are we talking I, I, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands? On the divorce itself, you had a full hearing mm-hmm. before one judge. You've been to the Court of Appeal and she's lost. You're going to go to the Supreme Court. Tens of thousands of pounds mm-hmm. just on the reason 
for actually getting the divorce. Mm-hmm. That's not dealing with money. That's no, not dealing with children. Sort of the finances out of um, at this stage. You know, no. um, that's mm-hmm. just dealing with whether or not she's entitled mm-hmm. to the divorce on a marriage that is patently over. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a nonsense. It's a clear nonsense. Mm-hmm. The Supreme Court can't change the law. They may be able to interpret the law on the particular facts of this case in a way that allows the divorce. But fundamentally, the, the blame game will remain mm-hmm. unless government legislates to change it. Right. So the only good thing about this whole sorry state of affairs is it shines a light on the ridiculousness of the current state of affairs. Yes, I mean, even the Daily Mail, who have been <laughs> vociferous <laughs> opponents of this in the past, yeah. and particularly in the 90s um, when we had the Family Law Act, mm-hmm. were, were really quite vehement against mm. it. Even their columnist actually said, what do you mean she's been prevented from having mm-hmm. a divorce? Mm-hmm. And they saw it actually as... A, a sort of almost a feminist issue. Mm. Right. You know, here is a man who yeah. was just saying, I am not going to grant you a mm. divorce, even though it's obviously over, mm-hmm. um, wielding power and preventing something mm. which she, she wants and is important to mm. her. But that's the law as it stands at the moment, irrespective of how a different judge might have interpreted it differently. Mm. Mm. The Court of Appeal said, can't show that you're definitely wrong. And that's why it's a nonsense. Mm. That's why it's intellectually dishonest. That's why it's damaging. Well, that's why it's it's preventing people from getting on with what really matters. I'm really interested in about the sort of how the age of the clients might affect things. I think mm. the case you're talking about there, the couple are in their seventies, I think, aren't they? Yeah, and so a, he is certainly yeah. right. I was just thinking about how, uh, as we work more with younger clients, I was thinking, for example, today I was reading about Donald Trump Jr. and how he is maybe approaching his impending divorce from his wife. And, and I think they're sort of still wanting to spend time with the, the children. There have been photographs of them recently spending time together with the children. And the article I was reading was contrasting that sort of experience, current experience, with his experience as a, I think it was a 12-year-old boy when his father, Donald Trump Sr., the president, uh, was divorced. And it was a horrific time for Donald Jr. at that point. He spent a long time not being in communication with his own father. And I was just reflecting on how the experience of divorce as a child will affect his divorce as now an adult. And I think that it's interesting as, as, as people are divorcing when they have had more experience of being children of divorce yes. a generation yes. ago. Yeah. I think the whole nature of divorce and younger people getting divorced when they may well have experienced, well, as they're more likely to have experienced divorce from their parents as the years go by. Mm. Um, so I think they will have experienced the horror of it. Maybe they will be more and more determined to, to, to definitely go for the more positive and amicable solutions. And I think we're beginning to see some experience of that in divorce hotel in this country. I think that that's what people will reflect upon. The reason I want to do this this way is because I want to do it very different from the way my parents did. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. I've certainly had clients and so are my colleagues at Mills and Reef who have come to us and said, we want to do this the right way because actually it it killed me mm. when I was mm. a kid to see what happened and I was caught up in this maelstrom. And one of the things that I often say to the, to the people I see is when you look back on this in 10 years' time, how do you want your children to have seen how you've gone about this? Very good question. Mm. Yeah. Because that's helping them to think beyond... Yeah. The difficulty yes. they're right now yeah. because it's very raw yeah. you know it's very difficult to actually step outside what you're feeling in those mm. early days of mm. anger and mm. pain mm. and just say you might not actually be able to to think about it now but just have a think about that question mm. because but it's I, really I think important. that goes back to what you were saying before David doesn't it about actually there are a certain set of emotional skills required to be able to navigate this well and how we teach people whether that's through school or accessing mental health issues mm. or you know a more psychologically aware society whatever we want to call it i think as we as a nation become more psychologically minded we're going to be able to increase the skills people have when they hit this bumpy patch and i think that's really critical because if we can enhance those skills before something awful happens then when something awful happens they've already got those skills to draw on haven't they rather than Mm. suddenly having to go through the divorce and perhaps it's the first time they've had to go and see a counsellor or a therapist or whatever so they've got to get their heads around that but if they've already got those skills and we're already becoming more psychologically aware psychologically minded then we're going to have a population of people who are better able to navigate divorce more successfully. I think it's a fascinating point you're mentioning. And um, we, do, do, 
quite a lot of work in sort of mediation in schools and sort of peer mediation training, for example. Right. Mm. And I think uh, your, your point about psychological education is really important. We can we can go into schools and, and educate mm-hmm. young people about how to mediate their conflicts. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, that's all going to be very, very helpful with those of whom end up in wanting a divorce situation in years mm-hmm. to come. Mm-hmm. So I think there is hope. And I think I was interesting, Nigel said earlier on, that we, we his, his expression that maybe we're, we're out of nappies, we're, we're at a toddling stage. Let's try and get to sort of have lessons as quickly. Yeah. Start walking yeah. with a bit, yeah. a bit of confidence. <laughs> well, the other, it sounds trite, but, and, and David and you, probably Kate will know this, but the, the other thing that helps people focus is, is, the, is the airline analogy, which is if the oxygen bags drop down mm-hmm. for yeah. the airline, you put mm-hmm. your own mask on before you help somebody yeah. else. So you've got to get people help yeah. mm-hmm. to be in a position where they can make informed decisions. Mm-hmm. And the trouble with, obviously, the divorce system that we've got at the moment, and you know, even if it's replaced with something else, there will always be this problem. People are on different timescales more often yes. than not. Yeah. One person may be thinking about the need to separate mm-hmm. for months and makes the decision the other person may not be anywhere that far down the road. Mm-hmm. And it's it's how you encourage people to, to give each other time, but not forever, yep. because otherwise... You know, one person's going to be held back, and it's going to that's going to be damaging. Yeah. And that's you know, professional help with that, counselling, ther- therapeutic help with that. It, it, I think it's actually key to that kind of decision making. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, gentlemen. So, David, Nigel, um, how can people find out more about you or get in touch, David? On our website, I think uh, divorcehotel dot com is the best way. And Nigel, divorce.co.uk, which is Mills and Reese dedicated website, and uh, resolution dot org dot uk. You can find out more about Amicable at www.amicable.io or you can follow me on Twitter at Kate underscore daily or you can follow the Divorce Podcast at Divorce underscore podcast. Thank you for listening. Mm